Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the SNAP seminar series. And uh, today, we're very happy to have uh, Michelle Mendes joining us. Um, uh, thank you, Michelle, for uh, uh, gracefully uh, agreeing to give the talk here. Um, uh, so Michelle is well known in the community, so I'll, I'll be brief with the introduction. Uh, so Michelle is currently a full professor of applied probability at the University of Amsterdam. Um, he has wide ranging research interests, including stochastic processes, queuing processes, uh, efficient simulation techniques, uh, and then their applications to transportation and then communication networks. Um, he is very prolific. He is the author of three books uh, and then more than uh, 340 papers in journals and conference proceedings. And then he's currently chair, program chair of several. Um, He's currently the editor in chief of Queuing Systems and serves on the editorial board of multiple other journals such as Stochastic Models and Journal of Applied Probability. Uh, so today he is going to talk about general multivariate Hox processes and the induced queuing processes, exact results and large deviations. Yeah. So Michelle. Yeah. Well, thanks very much for this nice introduction, and also thanks very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to uh, speak in the SNAP seminar, which is. In general, a great initiative. I think it's wonderful uh, well, to bring together people from all continents in this way. Um, well, the title was already given, uh, was already mentioned, General Multivariate Hawks Processes. I'll, I'll say much more about it uh, in a bit. Uh, before I get started, uh, I think it's good to emphasize that it's work together with two colleagues of mine from the Faculty of Economics, uh, Ravyar Karim and Roger Laven. But before I start, I first want to say a bit more about, uh, well, the journal that I'm editor-in-chief of, uh, so that is Queuing Systems, and I take the liberty to, uh, well, make some propaganda for this uh, very nice journal. So it's a methodologically oriented journal about queuing, but really seen from a more probabilistic angle, uh, I think. Most of you will know the journal, and I very much hope that you uh, well submit your your best work there. Um, well, on the website you can see what what topics are covered. Basically, it's all queuing theory seen from a methodological angle, but there is definitely a room for more, let's say, application uh, inspired work. And well, there's also currently the connection between data and queues that is getting more and more uh, emphasis. There will be a special issue very soon on queues and reflected Brownian motion. So it was like this wonderful conference on this topic uh, two weeks ago in Brittany in France. Uh, deadline is September 30, and it's not only for the participants of the conference. So everybody working in this area can feel free to uh, submit their work there. So I very much hope that you will do that. Okay, now we get to the real stuff. Um, Hawks processes, what is the idea? Well, one of the main overarching thoughts is that events, uh, when you observe them in time, frequently cluster. And well, one of the ideas of this presentation is that we want to come up with like a clean model that captures that clustering phenomenon. Um, well, there are ample uh, examples of this clustering phenomenon. Think of like earthquakes. If you have an earthquake, then it locally increases the geological tension and that could lead to aftershocks. So that was uh, covered by the seminal work of Ogata, but also in many other contexts, you can well, see a similar phenomenon Suppose that you sell a large quantity of stock. Well, then it can lead to a trading flurry afterwards. Well, there could be a collapse of a financial institution that could trigger shockwaves in a financial system. And you can also think of well, the, an application in epidemics, a contagious disease that can spread through a population. All of them examples in which there is a clustering of events. Well, then a, a short historic account in 1955, well, people started to think about this kind of clustering and there was the introduction of the so-called Cox process. And basically that's nothing else than a Poisson process with a random time change. What does that mean? 
well, it's a some process of which the rate is actually an independent, ev independently evolving non-negative stochastic process. Well, that already leads to some clustering, but well, uh, like 16 years later, well, there was this, this Hawks process and that is special for the following reason. There is also feedback from the counting process on the rate process. So there is some sort of circular phenomenon happening and that is what people call self-excitation. So the counting process is the result of the rate process, but there's also, well, an influence the other way around. So let us try to uh, introduce this uh, process in more formal terms. Um, and that uses the terminology of point processes. So this N of T is a counting process that records the number of events as a function of time. So that goes up by one every now and then when there is an arrival or an event. And N is characterized by the associated, what is called conditional intensity, lambda of T, which is, well, conditioned on, well, the, the, the past of the process, the mean of, well, uh, something happening in an interval of length H divided by H. So if you plug in the normal Poisson process, well, this lambda T is going to give you lambda. Um, what is a Hawks process? Well, a Hawks process is a point process that is defined in the following way. Well, in the first place, um, you can basically define it through three different scenarios. If you look at a little interval of length H, H is typically small, then there could be one event with probability proportional to the lambda t that I introduced, multiplied by the length of the interval, zero events with one minus this lambda t times h, and the probability of more than one event is negligible. So this you recognize from a definition of the Poisson process. And how is the Hawks process specifically defined? Well, that works with a so-called base rate, lambda bar, a positive number, and an excitation function, g, which is non-negative, decreasing, and integrable. And often it's assumed exponential, but we, in this study, don't assume that. Well, how is the lambda t defined for the Hawks process? Well, it's that base rate, so that you always have. So there are always like Poisson arrivals, but on top of that, there is this term, where here you recognize the excitation function and here you see the DNS. So that is something that goes up by one um, at every arrival. In other words, you see at every arrival, um, well, uh, a jump of the, of the rate process. And that is that self-excitation phenomenon that I was mentioning. You can also write it in another way, lambda bar plus, and then here you, have all the previous arrival epochs, previous meaning before time t, and then the g in t minus ti. So there's really this circular relation between the lambda and the nu, and that is the, well, the innovative aspect of the Hawks process. So this is the vanilla Hawks process as A.G. Hawks defined it in 1971. But in this talk, we consider much more general versions of it, namely, Hawks processes in which there are marks. In other words, in case there is an arrival at time ti, the intensity lambda ti increases by the g, as I showed you, multiplied by a non-negative random quantity, and that is called a mark. So that sort of magnifies the effect of the, of the jump. And in the second place, the Hawks process is multivariate. So what I showed you is univariate, self-excitation, but now there is mutual excitation between the different components of the multivariate Hawks process. And these uh, multivariate Hawks processes with marks, well, they form the basis for two other processes that we will be studying in this presentation. In the first place, population processes with generalized Hawks arrivals. And well, for the queuing people in the audience, these are really infinite server queues with Hawks arrivals. And in the second place, compound Hawks processes. So at 
every arrival an increment is added and those increments are iid random variables so that's a bit like a compound poisson process but not with poisson arrivals but with hawks arrivals and based on that we can actually define a single server queue so i'll go into that uh, later on in way more detail so what is that multivariate more marked hawks process well here you recognize the univariate version but then with a few uh, extensions in the first place uh well we have these ni's now rather than n and the, the ni's depend on the lambda i's so here you have a vector really of uh, counting processes and the ith component is the base rate of the ith component plus and then cross excitation from all the other components so if the, the j j counting process jumps you get a push up in the lambda i process in the beginning i always thought well this ordering of the indices i and j is actually a bit strange because it's the impact of j on i and why isn't it j i instead of i j but that is apparently what people in this community do so it's a bit confusing but bear with me Oh, and again, these BIJs are uh, non-negative IID random variables. So these are the marks, now multivariate marks. BII is self-excitation and BIJ is cross-excitation. A quick question. The, the lambdas can only go up? No, no, no. The, I'll show you a graph in a, in a moment and then uh, I'll answer your question implicitly okay. along the way. Good question. I'll, I'll show you a graph in a bit. Okay, um, but before I do that, I say a bit about, um, well, the underlying network structure, if you wish. Um, well, that is sort of defining the end process. Actually, it can be, well, um, seen in terms of Markov theory terms. It can be transient or re recurrent. What do I mean there? Well, suppose that you have a structure in which there is one transient class and one recurrent class. Well, then there's basically self-excitation going on here. And this one excites the other. And here there's self-excitation again. And another example is this one in which there is a transient class, only self-excitation. And here there's mutual excitation between two and three. Um, so is the model clear? I'll, I'll get back to Fernando's question in a bit, but. Uh, important uh, to notice is that uh, this process is not automatically stable. So you have to assume or to impose some assumption. And that is in terms of the spectral radius of a certain matrix and the components of that, the entries of that matrix are given by the mean marks uh, multiplied by the integral over the decay functions and suppose that the spectral radius of this matrix is smaller than one um, things don't blow up and for well queuing people it really plays the same role as the row smaller than one assumption that we are all familiar with important it's irrespective of the base rates i'm not going to say much about it but it's perhaps something to think about yourself how come that the base rates don't have impact um, well you can see how that works if you use some concepts that i'll explain a bit later basically the main argument relies on the so-called cluster process re representation that is due to hawks and oaks for the well the single dimensional hawks process without marks and the main idea there is that they distinguish between two kinds of arrivals um well informally you could say that there are arrivals due to the base rate lambda bar and arrivals that are generated by the offspring of it so of the children in a way of uh of the the ones that's were generated by the lambda bar, which we call the immigrants. And well, you can imagine that under the hood, there is a so-called branching structure going on. And that concept helped us enormously in understanding how 
things worked. That was already discovered, uh, well, way back in the 70s uh, for the conventional Hox process, but also for this, well, way more general setting, we still have a branching structure. Well, now I get back to uh, Fernando's question. So here you really see, uh, well, a sample path of the ends and the lambdas for a two-dimensional setting. So what you see is that, um, well, they mutually uh, impact each other. The, well, the shocks uh, sort of correspond with each other, as you can see. So you can see, for instance, uh, here, this lambda one process, it has jumps upwards at the moment that either the N1 jumps or the N2 jumps. And the height of the jumps are the, the marks. And after the mark, there is the, well, you go down with the, the lambdas go down because of the G. So there's this decay. So I hope this answers your question. So this is really how the mechanism works. All right. Um, so for the model, then, uh, Let's go to the first uh, topic of today, and that is, um, well, the joint characterization of the lambda process and the N process at a given point in time. So we fix T and we want to find somehow the joint distribution of these two vectors. But for the purposes of this presentation, we do something way simpler, namely, D is one single dimensional and only N. So we forget about the lambda for the moment. And the reason is that, well, that proof is more transparent. And at the same time, um, well, the basic ingredients are the same as for this more general setting. So what is the stability condition in this one dimensional setting? Well, the mean of the mark multiplied by the integral of the decay function should be smaller than one. So what is a gen, uh, well, kind of um, important concept in the analysis? That is the so-called cluster size, S of U. The number of children of an immigrant, immigrant due to this lambda bar uh, base rate, U time units after its birth, including the immigrant itself. So it is at least one. And it has a PGF that we call ADA. So ADA will play an important role later on. So why is it that we are interested in this ADA? Well, the thing that we are after, the PGF of N of T, can be expressed in, in terms of ADA in a very simple manner. So you basically condition on the number of immigrants, rivals due to the lambda bar, and given its K of them, well, these are independent of each other and have arrived at a uniform epoch in the interval zero T. And when they have arrived, they give rise to a cluster. So that is precisely how we got this expression. And well, if you work out the, uh, uh, the, well, the power series, then you get this expression here. Bottom line, if we know the eta, then we have the object that we are interested in. So the next question is how to compute the eta. And for that reason, there is this wonderful distributional equality. Um, so if you look at the cluster size S of U, well, that's at least one. And then every, um, well, uh, um, well, child of this uh, parent, of this immigrant generates a new cluster, but with less time remaining, U minus the I if the I is the arrival of that child. Um, well, you can, also write it like this, where K of U is an inhomogeneous Poisson counting process with rate B, size of the mark, multiplied by the G, uh, the decay function evaluated in U. So that is a very beautiful relation and you see a sort of self-similarity arising. S of U is distributed like something that is distributed in the same way but with less time remaining. The SI of U are IID copies of SU. So that is important. So this trick will give us like a nice fixed point relation from which we can solve the eta. So SI of U can be inter interpreted as the number of ch children of child I, including the child itself. 
So how do we get this fixed point validation for ADA? Well, to do that, we need uh, the following probability, PTS, and that is the probability that conditional on a child being born before time t, it was actually already born before time s. So that is the definition of PTS. And you can express that in terms of that k process that I defined on the previous slide. PTS is, well, in the numerator, you see that it was born at time s uh, and no new uh, child was born between s and t. And here you see the probability of the condition. And you can rewrite it like this. So suppose that you condition on the size of the mark. We just find that, well, suppose that you introduce this rs of t like this and the g as the integral of the decay function. Well, then pts is here. Well, you see the probability of zero arrivals between zero and s, and then one arrival between s and t, right? These are for some random variables. And in the denominator, the probability of one arrival between zero and t. And if you go through the motions, you get precisely gs over gt. And note that the mark b cancels. So this one we need in the next slide. Capital P T of S. There's also little p t of S, and that is the derivative of uh, capital P. And that plays an important role in the derivation. So this may look a bit scary, but I'll guide you through the steps. And well, I hope you understand the main line of the reasoning. The first line is basically conditioning on two things, namely the size of the mark. Suppose it has value x, and given x the well the the number of arrivals and then well this is then really the pgf of the cluster size conditioned on both of them and then there are a few things that we can actually uh, compute well here you have the, the density of the marks given that b is equal to x then this is the probability of k arrivals and then each of them arrived at a uniform point in time in that interval um, well, here you can use, well, precisely that uh, little p of, of uh, u and s that I defined before. Observe that there is less time remaining. It's not u anymore, but u minus s now. And well, then you get this expression. By the way, this z over here is that first immigrant, the contribution to the PGF by that first immigrant. And then it's a matter of a little bit of calculus. So here you recognize a power series that you can actually uh, compute. And the, the good thing is, well, this is really like, um, well, the density of the B. Here you see something in terms of the, uh, well, an exponent in terms of X in some weird argument. So that is the Laplace transform of, of B evaluated in a certain point, namely this point. So if you put things together, you get eta in terms of eta, albeit in another argument than the original u, it's the u minus s. So this is a fixed point equation that in principle, um, well, characterizes eta uh, uniquely. Any questions at this point in time? Important is that we can prove that, uh, well, there, there is a unique solution to this uh, equation. We can actually prove that in the more general case that I'll be discussing in the next slide. And an important thing is that if you do like repeated iteration, then you end up at that point. So it's actually a contraction, and that is precisely what you would like to have. So that's very good for numerical purposes. So this was everything about that multi or that single dimensional object, but I promise you that in the end we would uh, go to a way more general setting, namely the full vector of lambdas and the full, full vector of n's. And the great news is that we can actually deal with that in more or less the same way. So we can go through exactly the same procedure. Everything becomes a bit more involved, but well, all the steps carry over, and you get your 
uh, joints LST PGF type of thing uh, in these terms. Well, I don't uh, expect you to parse this uh, ugly formula, but the most important thing is that uh, it works precisely in the same way and it contains something that you can find from a fixed point equation, precisely as the ADA that we have seen before. So that is uh, really wonderful news. We can do the thing that we wanted to do. This I already mentioned, fixed point equation has a unique solution in the domain, which can be found by iteration. So under the stability condition, if you do like repeated iteration, then you end up with uh, the thing that you want to end up with. And why is it that we would like to have this joint transform? Well, in a way it characterizes uniquely the distribution. So if you uh, have the tools to do like a multivariate uh, PGF slash Laplace inversion, then you can find well, the distribution function and the density, but you can also do like numerical um, uh, differentiation to get all the moments. So uh, Rafiar, who is in the audience, actually implemented this and this worked out surprisingly well. So in a stable way, you can find moments. And importantly, we didn't assume anything on the G. So many other studies uh, look at the Markovian case in which the G is exponential, but we can really do that also for, let's say, power law decay, for instance. And that is, uh, that is nice. Also because some empirical studies reveal that power law is often like a useful model. For instance, in the earthquake context, power law seems to be the, uh, the right framework. So, I, quick yes. question. You, you mentioned that this fixed point equation is good for uh, numerical purposes, uh, but um, this, you know, probably is a stupid question, but uh, this is a fixed point equation of a function. Uh, so, which means that evaluating it, and then it involves the integral. So, and then, so if you do iterations, every time you have to first estimate the integral and then make sure that you are kind of within the right uh, error bounds, you know, so basic, basically your estimate is precise enough and then you can then do this over and over again. Is that, um, that's, it's, that's, that's roughly precisely right. <laughs> yeah. So the, uh, you're plugging in a function and then you iterate that function. Yeah, yeah that's see. what it is. And uh, okay. the, let's say the contraction proof is really in, in that space. So you have to be pretty careful. It's not uh, like the contraction in your normal uh, uh, one dimensional sense, but it's really- Right, well, it's function. a function, function space, right? Yeah. 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 So yeah. I, I guess Very my question, point. let me, sorry, sorry to, if, to take more time, but, but let me just very quickly follow up. Uh, every time you discretize the integral, it still introduces a little bit of error, right? Uh, every iteration. So you, you kind of have to be pick the disc discretization very carefully to make sure that the error doesn't propagate. Is that uh, yeah. kind of the idea? Now I have to look at Rafia who did this implementation. Can you say a bit about it? Uh, yes, uh, very briefly, but the, the, the rate of contraction is quite fast. So if even if you would make a discretization, like if you would make a very uh, broad discretization in your uh, time, it would uh, fade quickly enough. But okay. typically, I mean, it's, it's, it, it converges very quickly. So any normal computer with sufficiently small discretization steps will, yeah, it will make sure it converges very quickly to the uh, joint transfer you see there. Okay. Uh, I guess I'll take a look at the paper in detail. Yeah. <laughs> Let us know if you have any additional questions, obviously. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so what is interesting is that uh, you can also look at like population process versions of it. So basically what I mean here is that when there is an arrival, then this individual stays in the system for some time. Let's say um, if it's about component I, it stays in the system for a random variable VI. And well, that was really motivated by this epidemics uh, context where people get, uh, remain ill for some random time. And you may want to know how many people are ill simultaneously. 
And what is the great news? The great news is that everything, literally everything carries over with the only change is that that single uh, or that contribution of the immigrant has to be weighted with, well, the event, whether or not this person is still there or not, whether it recovered or not. So the, this is the indicator of the V being larger than U. But if you go to the, the fixed point equation, well, you have to adapt it a little bit, but in essence, it remains exactly the same. So this is basically a sort of infinite server version of the, uh, of the counting process. People can actually leave at some point independently of each other. So this uh, is what a queuing theory person would call a Hawks G infinity queue. Let's go to a more specific context. So if the GIJ are exponential, I already mentioned that the system becomes more Covian uh, and then things become really nicer. I very quickly skim through a number of results about the joint distribution of QT and lambda T. So Q was really this, uh, this, this number in the infinite server Q, given some initial values. And the objective is to well, characterize the system through this transform. And the claim is that you can actually do that. And here you see the results. Uh, again, don't be uh, intimidated by this slide, but I'll guide you through it and explain what is important. Well, important is that we have like a, a concrete expression for this transform as you would like to have, but it still contains um, two functions, z hat and s tilde. Z hat is given explicitly and s tilde is, well, basically the solution of a relatively easy differential equation under some boundary conditions. So that is basically what it is. Um, well, how to prove these things? Well, basically, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of roadmap that you have gone through several times before, I suppose. First, we use the Markov property on the cumulative distribution function of this QT lambda T process. And the idea is to relate the CDF of this thing at time T plus delta T at the CDF at time, time T. So of course, those are very similar with only a delta t contribution in the difference. Convert this into a differential equation by taking something to the left-hand side and divide by delta t and let delta t go to zero. Take partial derivatives to obtain its counterpart for the density rather than the CDF. Then you apply the Laplace and Z transform to obtain a PDF for this object that we were interested in. So this joint, uh, Laplace transform PGF. And then you use the method of characteristics to obtain a system of ODEs. And that is precisely what I showed you on the previous slide. So the, the concept is uh, relatively easy. Although, well, under the hood, you still have to do a lot of, uh, well, nasty computations. What is good about it? You can use those uh, joint transforms to derive joint transient and stationary moments. And that is, well, done in the, in the standard way. So if you have your uh, joint Laplace transform PGF of this type, um, well, suppose that these powers sum up to a n lambda and these powers sum up to some n q. Then the idea is to differentiate this object to the SIs, that is uh, n lambda i times and to the ZIs and QI times and plug in S is zero and Z is one. And then what turns out to be the case, and that is uh, beautiful, um, if you fix your N lambda and NQ, remember N lambda and NQ were these sums of these individual N lambda I's and NQI's, then you get um, a linear differential equation in terms of the solutions of the previous uh, and lambda and NQ. In other words, it facilitates an iterative procedure. Um, so basically, well, it's all about iteratively solving systems of linear differential equations. In stationarity, those differential equations become algebraic equations. So things are even simpler there. 
Higher order transient and stationary moments can be obtained in closed form. That is also uh, quite nice um, in, the, in terms of a sequence of uh, nested block matrices. So that has important computational advantages. So in the end, we can do these things extremely accurately and quickly. Just to give you an impression, here are a few graphs for first moments here of the lambda IT and here of the QIT. You see like the, the smooth curves being the results of our computations and uh, well, less smooth curves are results from simulation. And you see a nice fit and well, you see that things are close to simulation and here you see that, uh, well, for the, for the Q process, it's actually already a bit worse than for the lambda process. Well, we uh, tried to see how far we could get. So we also did the same thing for second moments. Things still work and well, simulations become already less attractive. And well, important to notice, of course, is that the precision of your simulation is uh, well parameterized by uh, well, the number of runs that you do. So here you already see uh, an advantage of our technique. And things get worse when you go for like third moments, then uh, simulations become like a less attractive alternative to our computations. Um, well, a general conclusion here is that when you compare with simulation, well, the simulation performance, uh, performance is obviously parameterized by the precision that you go for. Well, the longer or the, the more precise you want to have your estimate, the longer it takes. Uh, so here you see like a table in which you see, uh, well, Monte Carlo simulations of the first moments uh, for well some points in time, T is five. And simulation is compared to the true value determined by our methods until the standard error is smaller than some percentage epsilon. And the runtime and the number of runs are recorded in the table. Well, you see that if you want to go for like 1% precision, it already takes quite a while, 126 se seconds. And uh, well, here you see the number of runs. And that is for the first moments. So that is already taking a while. Well, here you go for second moments. And then you see, uh, well, already uh, like uh, order of 18 hours for this entry over here, if you go for 1% pr precision. So that is already uh, like an illustration of the, the benefits of our technique. Computations in our, uh, well, with our technique are virtually exact and nearly instantaneous. In other words, computations outperform simulations by an enormous margin. So simulation uh, sounds attractive. You don't need to understand anything of the problem. You just code your, uh, your system in a, in, a, in a Monte Carlo way. But the price you pay is, well, some imprecision, but most of all, well, it's extremely slow if you want to go for precise results. Even if you would go for, um, well, doing things in parallel, uh, suppose that you work with 32 cores, then, well, you reduce this uh, uh, 18 hours by a factor of 32. Well, you still end up with like almost half an hour instead of, uh, almost instantaneous response. Okay, so the last like 50 minutes will be about uh, the single server counterpart. So, so far we dealt with infinite server queues. Let's now discuss the single server counterpart and that is actually much harder than the infinite server queue. And the reason is, well, the most important reason is the reflection at zero. I'm not going to go into details, but that is really the thing that complicates everything enormously. So in the infinite server queues, the customers don't see each other. So they move through the system in parallel. In the single server queue, there's actually waiting. And the waiting makes everything harder. So how to define the single server queue? Well, there is something that we could call a compound generalized Hox process which is actually, well, the sum over, well, here you see the N of the, uh, of the Hox process of a number of compounds. And those have like a general distribution um, U. 
and that is drawn independently for every event in NJT. So it's really like the compound Poisson process in multiple dimension, but now the uh, arrivals are generated by a multivariate marked Hox process. So every component in NJ can influence the ZIT. So there is some, some cross effect going on. So you could look at one component, let's say the Jth. Uh, so NJT are the number of arrivals and the UIJR are the surface requirements. There is a constant surface PR and we are interested in the workloads and the queuing theorist would call this model a box G1 queue. Well, as before, you could uh, make plots of the N processes and one and N2, but here you see, well, the disease that correspond to it, the compound Hawks processes that jump when one of these two processes jump. So what is the main objective? I already mentioned that exact analysis is hard, uh, but what can be done is tail asymptotics. So I'll very briefly sketch a large deviation principle for compound generalized, generalized Hawks processes. And we focus on the logarithmic asymptotics pertaining to the rare event behavior, the workload exceeding some high threshold U. And then I'll say a bit more about rare event simulation, uh, which can be done by important sampling, where ordinary Monte Carlo fails. In the end, we're interested in, uh, well, probabilities of this type, multivariate. So let's say dimension two, the, in the dimension one, as well as the dimension two, you exceed some threshold at time t, and that is the probability q of a. But primarily we're interested in, let's say the marginal workload exceedance probabilities defined in this way. So there is a t for which the zit crosses a certain straight line. And that is something that you, well, probably recognize from queuing applications. R is the surface rate. So it depends on the full generalized Hawks process because the Z does, right? The Z depends on all the NIs. So we, still you are dealing with a multivariate Hawks process in the background. And we assume stability. Otherwise this uh, probability is one, which is a bit boring. So what is the result that I want to highlight first? That's an LDP of the, of the Z process. So we can come up with a function lambda star such that the decay rate of the probability of the sample mean of the Z process being in some remote set B is sort of sandwiched by these two infima. So this is something you probably recognize as a standard LDP. The question is how to prove it. What is the intuitive meaning of such an LDP? Well, basically it says that the probability of a rare event decays exponentially in the scaling parameter, which is T in this case. What is the candidate for the, for the rate function? Lambda star, well, that is as always a Legendre transform of the limiting cumulant. That is something that you may have seen before in the context of maybe Cramer's theorem. So the limiting cumulant is defined in this way through uh, the Z process that we have been focusing on. So what is this uh, lambda theta star? Well, let's try to compute it in a one dimensional case and it carries over actually to multiple dimensions. So if you uh, look at it in dimension one, well, then we can rely on the results that we have seen before. We found the result for the uh, well, the PGF of n of t, well, if we send t to infinity, we get the counterpart for, well, basically the, the n process. And we found that the eta satisfied this fixed point equation. And here you have it again for this single dimensional setting. Well, because the n and the u are independent of each other, the uh, MGF of z is given by this. Uh, expression over here, and you basically condition on, uh, on the N of T. And if you do so, then you end up with this expression for the thing that we were interested in. So this is the, uh, the lambda 
that features in this PGF, in this uh, LDP, sorry. So what is the result that we were able to prove? Well, we were able to prove that this multivariate compound Hawks process satisfies the LDP. And in order to prove that, well, basically we use the, the standard hammer that you can use in these circumstances, namely Gagner Ellis. Uh, well, Gagner Ellis wants you to check a number of conditions and there really the work, uh, uh, well, some work has to be done. And the most important thing that uh, requires some work is to prove that the uh, limiting MGF uh, fulfills the so-called steepness condition, meaning that the derivative of lambda uh, goes to infinity when you approach the boundary of the domain. And the cool thing in this situation was that we could use an implicit relation for, uh, for, the, for, the, for the lambda, capital lambda. We don't have an explicit uh, characterization of the domain of lambda, but we can prove that if you go to the boundary of the domain, that indeed the, the slope of the lambda goes to infinity. So we have some differential equation that relates lambda to lambda prime, and that does the trick. So you have to be very careful there, but uh, with a nice argumentation, you can actually prove this. A very uncommon way of proving steepness. I've never seen it before. So you really use the relation between lambda prime and lambda that in principle is the consequence of the branching property of the Hawkes process. So that is beautiful. Um, the last topic of today is about workload exceedance probabilities. As I said before, they are given in terms of the Z process crossing a certain uh, straight line. And you can actually prove that these properties under a light tail condition uh, decay exponentially with the decay rate that solves a certain equation where the lambda one is the lambda that I was just introducing, but evaluate at this uh, specific point. So this may remind you of, uh, well, uh, standard results in the random walk context. So these actually carry over to this, uh, well, way more uh, complicated situation. Proof is pretty uh, standard in terms of setup. You still need to do quite a bit of work, but if you go through the, the steps, the lower bound is basically the contribution of the most likely event in this union of events. So you maximize this thing over T, the most likely time scale, and then you use the LDP that I uh, gave in theory three. In the upper bound, you have to do much more work because you have to prove that the contributions of other timescales don't matter. So that requires you to, well, come up with some bounds on tail probabilities. It's a combination of union bounds and some, some tricks and that works out in the end, but you have to be quite careful there. In the end, the contributions around that most likely timescale are the only ones that matter. Um, the last slides are about important sampling. That is about estimating these probabilities P1 for you large. Um, well, typically in the domain that uh, overflow is rare. So let's say 10 to the power minus six. That means that, well, just Monte Carlo doesn't work in the first place because, well, you need many runs. But in the second place, and that's important in this context, if your U is large, then also a single run takes a lot of time because you have to use that branching property in your simulation of a single run. So the idea is to use important sampling, um, simple under another measure than your actual one and don't record your performance measure of interest, but multiply it with a likelihood ratio that sort of takes into account the difference in likelihood between the two probability measures. The common way to do that is uh, by exponential twisting. And here you see, well, what that amounts to. And that looks way simpler than it actually is because you have to well find, uh, well, the, the change in the law of your model primitives to make this happen. And you remember that, for instance, it, this eta function was only defined in an implicit way, 
namely as the solution of a fixed point equation. So you have to find out how to change that fixed point equation to make sure that you get this change of measure. So that was far from trivial. Um, important is that under Q, well, the, the Q becomes unstable. So you really go to, uh, to plus infinity. So in principle, in every run, you see overflow, but the likelihood ratio at the moment of overflow is a small number. So it still gives you an unbiased estimator. Proposition, it's the best you can do. Um, okay, the first proposition is that um, it's still a generalized Hox process if you do this exponential twisting. So that is nice. So it has adapted base rates and adapted decay function, adapted mark distributions and adapted claim size distributions. So you remain in the same family as before. Um, and while well, your estimator is the standard one, but now you, well, basically observe those likelihood ratios and that gives you an unbiased estimator. Simulation of the runs. Well, basically you have to simulate that Hawks process. And there, well, the way to do that is by relying on Ogata's thinning algorithm. And here uh, you see the claim that I already mentioned. In a way, it's the best you can do. So it's asymptotically efficient. So within a certain class of changes of measure, it's the one that gives you like the most variance reduction. The proof is actually based on the so-called Lundberg bound there is like a uniform bound on the probability that you're estimating an exponential bound of this type, which basically implies that also the variance of your estimator is smaller than some exponential bound. And that does the trick. So you cannot do better than this. And that gives you asymptotic optimality. Um, some numerics, you see an orange line and a blue line. The orange line is the uh, well, the asymptotic decay rates. For different values of U, we computed by simulation the P1 of U, and you see nice convergence to it. So that is reassuring. So it does what it should. And in this table, you get an impression of the speed up. And well, it's a bunch of numbers, obviously, but the most important numbers are in the last column. It's the speed up factor. And here you see that the speed up can become enormous when you go to the domain of 10 to the power minus five or smaller. So 10 to the power minus five gives you like order uh, 10,000 uh, speed up, which is uh, of course great. Other conclusions, uh, under important sampling, the number of runs is very slowly increasing in you. Under conventional Monte Carlo, it blows up like the reciprocal of the probability that you're estimating. So here you really see the, uh, the reason of the speed up. You have to be careful though, even under the important sampling, you still have to sample a Hawks process and it becomes an unstable Hawks process, meaning that the number of events per run can become pretty large, but still it outweighs the, uh, well, the drawback that you would have of simulating under the original measure, you gain still a lot by doing it under important sampling. In the relevant domain, well, there is really an enormous speed up. So it's uh, really a very helpful tool. When taking decay functions, uh, exponential, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> I, I'm already at the last slide. So the, a few related topics, when taking the decay functions exponential, the system becomes Markovian. Um, well, we devise procedures for evaluating moments, but I think there is much more to be done there with, uh, well, uh, setting up like numerical procedures to do so. Another topic that we have been thinking about for future research is, uh, well, more or less about the what we call opposite dynamics. So are there any clean models in which an increased activity brings back the rate to a normal value instead of the opposite? So the this is sort of inverse Hawks and we haven't really found like a clean family of models that does so. So that is really like uh, an open invitation if you 
are aware of an interesting class of models, let me know. And the last uh, point that I want to, um, to mention here is that, well, why do we do these uh, numerical things? Well, quite often in numerics, it's about estimation. So you have like time series of some, uh, well, some, some, some variable as a function of time. And from it, multivariate, from it, you want to estimate, well, the parameters of your Hawks process. Quite often you rely on the method of moments then. And if you want to do that, well, then you have to have like very quick ways of computing moments because, well, you still have to do all kinds of numerical operations to get your estimates. So this um, operation of finding moments should be extremely fast and accurate. So that's the reason why we want to do it. And I think, um, our numerical uh, schemes very much uh, give a handle on solving these problems. Conclusions. Well, we looked at something way more general than the, the, well, the conventional class of Hawks processes. So we have multivariate Hawks processes and marked Hawks processes. And I think well, this, this general class is beautiful. We looked at induced population processes that can be interpreted like infinite server queues. Things sim simplify drastically when you go for the Markovian case, but in principle, we can deal with general decay functions. And the last part of this talk was about compound generalized Hawks processes that you can apply in the single server queuing context, but also, I guess, in the ruin context. Um, and there we proved a large deviation principle and we devised an important sampling procedure. And that was it. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, th thank you, Michelle. Uh, so uh, let's uh, thank uh, Michelle for a uh, really nice talk. So uh, maybe we can, we have some, a few minutes uh, for the questions. Uh, does anyone have question? Yeah, I do have a question. I, uh, yeah, it's just a quick question. I, I guess nothing changes very much if you change the uh, base rate from a constant to a known function. For example, you mentioned epidemic modeling as a motivation. So there you might want the base rate to be growing exponentially. Oh, that's an interesting point. I have never thought about it, but I guess that branching property uh, does change, right? I have at some point this was some number of children Right, and that is with the same lambda bar. So I guess that is the point where we have to be careful and see whether in some way the argument carries over. So I guess at that point, uh, things may become different. I see that if you're nodding, you may know what, uh, what goes on there. No, no details, but you're right. I, th I think uh, that is the point it does appear you. in the cluster representation. Yeah. So if you... Uh, apply it there it will appear you have to be careful i'm not entirely immediately sure that you can do that but i would be uh hopeful that in the markovian case you can still do it so, because then you it's all about setting up like differential equations and stuff and that is probably still possible but it's a yes. good point that in the epidemics context you probably want to work with time varying base rates right that is your idea Thanks. Other questions? Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. I had a, a small clarification question. So in my understanding, uh, the processes N and Lambda are equivalent. You can, one characterizes, they both characterize the same process. So what's the benefit of looking at the, at the joint distribution of it? No, that they, uh, yeah, this is an interesting question. Uh, it's nice that I talked to another Michelle, by the way. Um, it's an interesting question, but they don't, uh, you cannot translate them in one another. They are correlated, but they don't prescribe each other. 
So um, really, but you still need to to know them together. Uh, I, I mean, if if I get if I have the lambda process, I can reconstruct the end process from it, right, and vice versa. Uh, uh, if you're using a plus so. one embedding construction, for example, no. I don't think so. So if you go back to oh, I have to get back. Like, I mean, I guess there is this this graph that I showed you somewhere here. So I don't think that is possible, right? So for instance, the the size of the of the marks, yeah. Ah, yes, it's marks. You don't yes. see that from the end. Yeah. To mention something, I really yes. think they. Uh, yeah, you, you have to know them together. Yeah, yeah, it, with the marks, definitely, yes, thank you. Yeah, but even without marks, I think... Uh... Well, with, without marks, uh, I can see on the Lambda one, for instance, I can see the yeah, moments of jumps. In the case that, ah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah, then, I, so one way to uh, think systematically about it is to go for dimension one and to take marks equal to one then try to see whether you can reconstruct your end from your lambda and vice versa yeah. and in any sample path of your lambda you see exactly where the jumps happened right yeah. i think you're using like a plus one bedding construction where you look at your uh, point process uh, your stochastic intensity as uh, being uh, uh, as you look at the points of a uh, Poisson process with with uh, homogeneous Poisson process uh, with the intensity one in the plane and you look at the points under the curve of your lambda of your intensity and you reconstruct your end process that way like, uh, yeah you need a full past of your end process because you have to know well the value of the corresponding the case yeah right. yeah 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 good point thank you other questions so uh if other people don't have question i have a uh, i have one so uh in in the numerical experiments you uh so actually one 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 thing that probably uh so uh we, we in in the important sampling uh does the co computational effort uh for rec uh for generating one sample how is it affected like yeah so that is visible in this this k right so what you have here is the number of uh let me see so what was let me see. So what you see here is the number of samples to get a certain precision. So the number of runs really. And here the same for Monte Carlo. And here you see the speed up factor. So that is really in time. So from these three things together, you can see how uh, the effort of a single run uh, behaves as a function of you. Mm. And um, we didn't go into detail here, but my sense is that the number of uh, of the time needed to uh, to simulate a run also grows quite rapidly in you. But that effect is still sort of smaller than the effect of the rarity, uh. if you understand what I mean. So this branching structure obviously gives rise to, well, if your U becomes larger, there's more branching going on. And every branching uh, point creates new simulation effort. But mm -hmm. this, the output uh, shows that apparently that effect is smaller than the effect due to the rarity, right? So your U increases. I see, I see. So, and so I this guess there are, it must be known, I guess, the complexity of the Ogata algorithm, uh, but we, we didn't look into mm -hmm. that in, in, in detail. I see. So, so the kappa is like uh, CPU time or? Uh... Yeah, that's really CPU time. That oh, is I the see, most I fair uh, comparison. So the uh, ratio of the two CPU times. I see, I see. Yeah. And and uh, another question is uh, like, how, how does the choice of G affect uh, the whole thing? 
if so if it's uh, a power uh, uh, like polynomial rather than exponential yeah so i think we only tried here uh yeah so here i think in this part we need let me see um well the theta star should exist right so i think that's may oh. have impact on the type of g's that are allowed so all these experiments are for exponential g's if i uh -huh. recall correctly and i think that is implicit you are in this light tailed setting mm. so i think uh, that and it's a it's a good point of course and uh, i guess the uh, the effect of heavy tailed uh, marks for instance we didn't explore at all so then it's an open invitation to you, Chang, I guess to, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. you, you probably uh, can guess right away what a good algorithm would be if your marks are heavy tailed, for instance. Uh, we didn't go into that at all. So that is I pretty see. open still. I see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, thank you so much again. And uh, so does anyone have any other question? It's dinner time here, so I'm getting hungry. <laughs> okay, so if not, I'm going to stop recording. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. thanks a lot, by the way, Chang'an. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, oh, yeah. That's, uh, my great, great pleasure to have you here. Uh, uh, thank, okay. thank you again for uh, speaking here. Yeah. Okay, bye-bye.